The Bronze Bow, Chapter 8 Daniel had overestimated his strength. Long before he reached the mountain, he knew that he had left the shelter of Joel's passageway too soon. Toiling uphill under a merciless sun, he had to stop so often that it was late afternoon before he came to the steep zigzag rise up the cliff. He was not sure he could make it. Suddenly, it seemed to his wavering sight that one of the dark boulders high on the cliff detached itself from rest and rolled toward him. Samson came leaping down the trail to kneel at his feet. Then, when Daniel tried to speak and no sound would come, the big man rose swiftly, lifted the boy in his great arms, and carried him gently up the trail to the cave. Samson did not allow Daniel to get to his feet again for three days. Like a vast shadow, he sheltered him. He brought water mixed with wine in which he steeped roots of the mountain lilies. He snatched the choicest bits of roasting game from beneath the very nose of Rosh to feed his patient. Daniel noticed that the men were getting accustomed to Samson and treated him with better humor, though none of them ever disputed him. As for himself, Daniel had acquired new status. By the unfailing grapevine, word of his exploits in town had reached the cave days before. They had all given him up, believing him dead or captured. Some of the men admired his nerve. Others were relieved to have him in charge of Samson again. For a day or so, they made a hero of him, and then they forgot the matter and ignored him. And life in the cave went on exactly as before. For Daniel, nothing could ever be the same. He had never admitted to himself that he was lonely here on the mountain. He had worshipped and feared Rosh. He had fought and eaten and slept side by side with the hard-eyed men who made up Rosh's band. But the few days in Joel's passageway had shown him a new world. He had found someone to talk to. Someone who had shared his own thoughts, who had instantly taken Daniel's burden as his own. The memory of the pact they had made glowed like a warm coal in the heart of the forge. Lying in the sunlight, his back against the baked gray rock, Daniel repeated to himself the chronicles that Joel had read aloud. The glorious deeds of Joshua, of Phinehas, Saul, and David. Most of all, he thought of Judas Maccabees, who had given them a watchword. The other mighty ones had lived and fought in distant ages, but Judas had lived in a time like his own, not 200 years ago, when Israel was helpless, as it was now, under the foot of the heathen. Judas, with his heroic father and brothers, had dared to rise up and defy the oppressor, and for a time, Israel had breathed the free air again. Here in these very mountains, Judas, young and daring and cunning as a panther, had hidden from his enemies and taken them by surprise. Many brave men had joyfully laid down their lives for Judas, but never enough, never quite enough. This time, there were young men everywhere who longed for such a chance again. Together, he and Joel would find them. The third member of the pact? He was not sure about Thesha. In all his life, he had known only two girls, and he did not understand them. Compared to his own sister, Thesha was like a brilliant scarlet lily, glowing and proud. He could count on her loyalty to Joel. In all else, she was unpredictable. The very thought of her was disturbing. He tried to shut her out of his mind as he tried to shut out the thought of Leah. Both girls, so utterly unlike, seemed in some way to threaten his plans. The prospect of seeing Joel again occupied all his thoughts, and the opportunity came unexpectedly soon. A week after he was back at the forge doing the light work that Samson allowed him, Rosh brought him a dagger to mend. It was a special dagger that Rosh had carried for years as a talisman, and some mischance had sent it hurtling down a chasm. Five men had been sent to retrieve it. Four had come back empty-handed, but hours later, the fifth, exhausted and bleeding, had brought the thing back. Rosh received it with scant gratitude. It was bent askew, 
twisted out of the shaft and useless. Fix it, he demanded of Daniel. Daniel took the blade in his hand. He thought it might be mended, but he knew that he could not do the job. I don't have the right tools, he explained. It needs a new collar and a rivet. My forge doesn't give heat enough. Then get a rivet. Daniel looked back at the man. He would think a new dagger would be easier to come by, but he knew that Rosh had attached some sort of luck to this particular blade. In the city, he asked. Wherever you can find them. This friend of yours, Simon. He said he was an ironsmith. Get them from him. Daniel remembered that Simon and Rosh did not see eye to eye. You mean I could buy them from Simon? Buy? He's a zealot. He can give a scrap of metal for the cause. Daniel woke next morning hoping that Rosh had forgotten, but he saw at once that the leader was more determined than ever. He gave Daniel no money. All the way to the village, Daniel tried to think of an argument that would convince Simon. The metal parts that he needed were costly. Rosh seemed to think he could snatch them as he might a squash from a village garden. It occurred to him that perhaps, unknown to Rosh, he could offer to do a day's work in Simon's shop. The smithy was closed, a bar and a padlock across the door. Strange, for if Simon had gone off about the village to fit a lock or repair a plow, he would have left the shop open to customers. Daniel sat down on the storm doorstep to wait. After a time, he felt uneasy. The unoccupied feel of the place grew on him, and he was not surprised when a passing villager called out to him. If you're waiting for the smith, you'll have a long wait. Shop hasn't been open for a month. Where is Simon? Daniel called back. Left town. Heard he went after a preacher, one who came through here a while back. There's a new smith in Corazon if you want some work done. Gone after a preacher. All at once, Daniel remembered the Sabbath morning and the strange look in Simon's eyes. I don't know what he means, Simon had said, but I intend to find out. What could Simon have found that would keep him for a month? Daniel had not lived with Rosh for five years without learning that there was no use going back without the rivet. He knew well enough, too, what Rosh would expect, but Simon had been good to him. He refused to break into Simon's shop and help himself. There was nothing to do but find Simon, and with the thought, he knew a deep satisfaction. He knew that all along he had hoped for an excuse to go to Capernaum. Would he be recognized in the city? Daniel thought not. He had a hunch about Romans. To him, every stupid Roman face looked alike. He had an idea that, to the Romans, every Jew would look alike too. He was sure they seldom bent their stiff necks to take a good look at one. There was little likelihood that the soldier on horseback would remember the boy at the well. At any rate, it was worth the chance. He got to his feet and set out for Capernaum. He reached the city on the early afternoon and made his way straight to the harbor. If anyone knew where the preacher could be found, it would be those fishermen and their wives. They had taken the carpenter's coming for granted. Surely they must know where he spent the rest of his day. There was no bustle at this hour. The Jews jested that no one worked in the heat of the day but dogs and soldiers. The heavy barges bumped each other lazily, waiting for the next day's cargo. But farther along the shore, he saw a few slow-moving figures, men lazily preparing their fishing boat for the night's work. Daniel approached a fisherman who was folding a long net. I'm looking for a preacher, he said. I heard him talk here one morning. You mean the carpenter? The man nodded. He's back in town again. He'll be here tomorrow without a doubt. Do you know where I could find him now? That would be hard to do. Sometimes he goes about preaching. Sometimes he takes a wood turning job. But at night, you could find him at the house of Simon Barjonas on Bethsaida. 
He sleeps there. Besada was scarcely two miles the other side of the city, and there were many hours to spare before nightfall. Daniel had the excuse he wanted. He climbed the hill to the house of Hezron. He located the hinge door and swung it open at his touch. He picked up a sharp pebble and scratched the shape of a bow on the mud wall, looking carefully up and down the street, crawled through the door and along the passage. He waited for a long time. Twice he cautiously pushed open the door and peered out, knowing by the shadows on the street that he must soon be on his way. When he had almost given up hope, Joel came crawling along the passage. I've checked every day, he greeted Daniel. I didn't think you'd come so soon. It was just luck, Daniel explained about the dagger. Are you all right, Daniel? Thesha said your wound was not healed enough. You should have stayed here. With his usual thoughtfulness, Joel had brought a small loaf of bread, which Daniel munched gratefully. I must find Simon, Daniel said. It's time I started for Bethsaida, he hesitated. Could you go with me? This Jesus, I'd like to know what you make of him. Joel considered. There's talk about him everywhere, he said. Do you think he's a zealot? Father says he's dangerous. I'd like to see him myself. Yes, I think I'll risk it. At dusk, the two boys emerged from their hiding place, and Joel led the way through unfrequented streets till they came out at the path above the lake. Below them, four men were sliding their boats into the water. As they watched, three of the men climbed aboard. One took the heavy oar in his hand. The last man gave a shove and the boat drifted slowly from the shore, its image wavering on the glassy surface. The oarsmen began to sing, and the others took up the melody. For a long time as the boys walked on, the song floated back over the water with a strange sadness. The village of Besada was a tumbled mass of fishing shacks in the gathering darkness. Smoky light glimmered from the open doors of the huts. They followed the one narrow street till presently they overtook a man and a woman who walked slowly to keep pace with a small boy who stumbled between them. Before Daniel could speak, the man looked back and questioned them instead. Do you know which would be the house of Simon the fisherman? We're looking for it ourselves. The man nodded. With so many looking, it shouldn't be hard to find. But the boy was getting tired. We've walked all the way from Cana today. They told us in town the preacher would be at the house of Simon tonight. Daniel glanced at the child, noting the way he hugged one arm close to his body, wrapping it in his mantle. It's his hand, the woman explained. She reached out and pulled the mantle aside. Both boys started at the glimpse of the red, swollen flesh. The child flashed him a look of fury, jerked the mantle back into place, and trudged on, his eyes on the road. Bit by a camel, the man said, two months ago and it won't heal. I'm a weaver and so the boy must be after me and a weaver needs two good hands. We only heard about the preacher yesterday, said the woman. We have not wasted any time. Daniel was puzzled. This preacher, is, is he a doctor as well? He asked. Where do you come from that you haven't heard about the preacher? The man demanded. Our neighbor who came back from Capernaum said that they talk of nothing else. My neighbor saw him heal a man who had been lame for 20 years. The man ran, he told me, ran like a young boy. If this preacher can do that, he can heal my son. Daniel glanced at Joel uneasily. Have you heard of this? He asked under his breath. Joel hesitated. There is talk. Father says he checked himself and the two walked on silently, keeping their doubts to themselves. It seemed a shame to have made a child walk all the way from Canaan. Presently, the murmur of many voices came to them. The sound drew them away from the street into an alley, at the end of which they made out the outline of a house. The square of light, which was the doorway, 
was choked by many dark figures. People crowded the room inside and overflowed into the courtyard, blocking the path to the door. Some sat cross-legged on the ground or leaned against the gate. They seemed to be waiting. Daniel saw that many of them were ill. Some had been carried here and lay on the ground on crude litters. All about him he saw canes and crutches and the glimmer of bandages. From one corner of the yard smoke rolled from a clay oven carrying a pungent odor of frying fish. The two boys stepped around the litters. Daniel plucked the coat sleeve of a man who leaned on the doorpost. Peace, he said. Peace, responded the man. There's no room inside. The master will be out when he is finished eating. I'm looking for a friend of his, Daniel said. Simon, the blacksmith from Ketza. Do you know of him? The zealot? He's inside. The man leaned into the door and called out, Simon, there's one here asking for you. The figures in the doorway shifted. Framed against the square of light, Simon peered out into the dim yard. Here, Simon, it's Daniel from Ketza. Daniel! There was genuine pleasure in the man's voice. I'm glad you found the place. Come inside. Have you eaten? They pushed their way into a small room, smoky, airless, over full of dark bearded men. The smell of fresh bread, of fish, and burning oil made Daniel's head swim. He introduced his two friends to each other. By the look of you, you've walked all the way from the mountain, said Simon. But first, you must meet the master. One hand on each boy's elbow, he steered them across the room. Daniel stood face to face with the carpenter. The man's eyes looking straight into his blocked out every other thought. Filled with light and warmth, those eyes welcoming him with friendship, yet searching too, disturbing, demanding. I'm glad you've come, Jesus said. Daniel could say nothing at all. For a moment he was afraid. Only when the man turned away and his eyes no longer held his own could he breathe freely again. Simon found a place for the boys between two burly fellows who reeked of fish and garlic. Someone had led Jesus to the seat of honor at the head of the table. Several women were moving now among the men carrying wooden platters of bread and lettuce and small fish fried in oil. They placed the dishes on the mat before Jesus, and he looked up with a warm smile. You must have worked long, my daughters, he said, to provide a feast for so many. The women glanced sideways at each other, smiling, their brown faces flushed. Jesus reached out and took a wafer of bread from the plate. A voice spoke from the end of the table. Teacher, a man said, no one has provided for us to wash our hands. In this house, do you not observe the law? The women of the house gasped, <gasps> hand against her mouth in dismay. All her pride and pleasure was wiped out in an instant. Was it needful? Her eyes pleaded with the carpenter. I did not think so many. Do not be distressed, Jesus answered her gently. It was not needful. He looked down the long mat toward the man who had spoken. In this house, the food has been given us with love, he said slowly. Let us make sure that our hearts, rather than our hands, are worthy to receive this gift. He stood up, his long white robe, holding the light, and spoke a blessing over the bread. Then he passed the platter to the one beside him. Daniel glanced at Joel. With a pucker of confusion between his brows, Joel had taken a small morsel of the bread and was putting it to his lips. Perhaps this was the first time in his life Daniel realized that Joel had deliberately broken the law. He too must have felt the carpenter's words as a reproach. When the short meal was done, Jesus rose from the table, gave thanks again to God and to the woman of the house, then moved slowly through the crowded room to the door. Instantly, a clamor rose from the courtyard, a frenzy of wailing, shouting, pleading voices. Let me touch you, Rabbi. Let me only touch the edge of your cloak. My son, Rabbi, he's had the fever for seven days. 
Over here, Master, look this way. I cannot move for the crowds. Jesus stood on the threshold for a moment, looking out over the wailing people. Daniel, who had pushed close behind him, almost reached out to hold him back. Those people out there, so frantic. They could tear a man to pieces. But Jesus stretched out his hand and spoke, and the clamor died away. A few voices kept on pleading. The moaning could not be still, but once again, the crowd waited. Then Jesus stepped down into the courtyard and moved with serenity among them. Feeble hands reached out to him, stretched and gasped at his clothing. Some of the sick dragged forward, and when they could not reach him, kissed the ground behind him. Before one after another, Jesus stopped. Sometimes he spoke quietly. Sometimes he touched a man briefly, or a child. What he said, no one could hear. Suddenly, a scream rang out. I am well, a woman cried. He has cured me. I am well. The clamor rose again, drowning her out. The woman, who had served Jesus, moved now among the crowd with platters of food, and the bearded fishermen helped them. Hands snatched the food as it passed, cramming it into their mouths, spilling it in frantic greed. Daniel understood now why those in the house had eaten so sparingly. There would never be enough to satisfy this starving horde. He shuddered, looking at them. Where had they come from, these wretched creatures who had dragged themselves to this place in the hope of a morsel of bread? Then Daniel saw the man and woman he had met on the road, standing almost within the reach of Jesus' hand. As Jesus turned, they pushed the child in front of them. The woman went down on her knees and hid her face. The man stood, his eyes fixed on Jesus. Then four men carrying a litter blocked him from Daniel's view. And when he saw them again, the three were going rapidly through the gate in the hedge. He sprang after them. Did you see him? He demanded, catching up with them. Did he speak to you? Tears were streaming down the woman's face. Her eyes were dazed and she could not speak. The man had the same dazed look. The boy is healed, he said. How do you know? Daniel demanded. Have you looked at it? No, I have not looked. Show him your arm, the man ordered his son. The boy shook off the mantle and held out his hand. It doesn't hurt anymore, he said, puzzled. Daniel felt a sudden chill. He leaned closer. It is still swollen, he accused the man. The man did not look. The pain is gone, he said. The swelling will go too. What did he do? Did he touch it? No, the man said. I don't think he touched it. I started to tell him what was wrong, and I couldn't get the words out. I could only look at him, and then I knew that the boy was all right. Suddenly, Daniel was furious. You are lying to me, he cried. There is some trick. Why should I lie to you? The man looked back steadily. I tell you, the boy's hand is healed, and now he will make a weaver. Back in the yard, Simon stood with Joel. Daniel clutched at the older man. That boy, he stammered. Simon, he said his arm was healed. Simon did not ask what boy or seemed surprised. Yes, he said quietly. But I saw it. We both saw it not an hour ago. The boy says it doesn't hurt. Several people were healed tonight, said Simon. It's impossible. Is it some trick? You say you saw the arm yourself. What do you think? I don't understand, nor do I, Simon answered, but I must believe my own eyes. I have seen it happen over and over. Joel spoke thoughtfully. Is he a magician? No magician could do the things he does. He claims that his power comes from God. But these other people, all these, I don't know why they are not all healed. It seems to require something from the person himself, a sort of giving up. The child you saw, or his parents, must have had that sort of faith. Perhaps the arm would have healed anyway. Perhaps, said Simon. He put a silencing hand on Daniel's arm. 
Wait now, he is going to speak. For the third time, something in Daniel leaped to answer that voice. It was not a joyous voice tonight, nor a commanding one as it had been on the sunlit shore. This time, its gentleness rested on the suffering people like a comforting touch. But strength still poured through its calm tones and utter sureness. Do not be afraid, Jesus said to them, for you are the children of God. And does not a father understand the sorrow of his children and know their need? For I tell you, not even a sparrow falls to the ground without our father seeing. And you are of more value than any sparrows. Try to bear your suffering with patience, because you know that God has made a place for you in his kingdom. A kingdom. Daniel looked about him. What good would it do to speak of a kingdom to these miserable wretches? What could it mean to them when not one of them could lift a hand to fight for it? But he saw their faces. White, formless blots in the darkness all lifted toward this man. He heard their harsh breathing all around him, stifled in their straining not to miss a word. They listened as though his words were food and they could never get enough. But you must be kind to each other and love each other, the voice was saying, for each of you is precious in his sight. The figure in the white robe swayed slightly. In the dim light from the doorway, the man looked very weary. Instantly, one of the fishermen was at his side. Another came from the house with a lighted lamp. Together, shielding him from the people, they persuaded their master across the garden. The crowd watched them, quieted, almost stupefied, by the spell of that gentle voice. The three climbed the outside staircase of the house and entered the shelter on the roof. Daniel straightened his shoulders, trying to shake off the spell that seemed to bind him close to the silent crowd. At the same time, he remembered the errand that had brought him to this place. Simon listened, showing little interest in Rosh's demands. Daniel was sure that Simon was going to refuse his request, but instead, the man looked at him keenly. This Rosh, he said thoughtfully, you have a lot of faith in him, haven't you? Of course I have. All right, I don't have these things to spare in my own shop, but there is a shop here in the city on the street of the ironworkers. You will know it by the bronze horseshoe over the doorway. I work for the owner sometimes. Samuel is his name, and he owes me wages. Tell him to give you what you need. But your wages? I have little need for money just now. Take what you need. Daniel could not leave his friend without some answer. Are you staying with Jesus, Simon? If he will have me, is, is he one of us? Simon smiled. A zealot, you mean? Isn't that why you came? Have you asked him to join us? I had some such idea when I came, Simon admitted, but it has not worked out just as I expected. No, I have not asked Jesus to join us. All I hope and long for now is that he will ask me to join him. Daniel saw that he would get no more certain answer from Simon tonight. The two boys went back along the road in silence. Presently, Joel spoke, his young voice troubled. How can he call those people children of God, he questioned. They have never heard of the law. They are unclean from the moment they are born. Daniel could not attach too much importance to this. He was too far outside the law himself. Perhaps it does no harm for them to hope, he suggested. But they have no right to hope. Joel was silent again, struggling in some way Daniel could not share to reconcile what he had heard with his lifelong training. I think father is right, he said at last unwillingly. This man is not a true rabbi. He practically said it was all right to eat without washing your hands. Perhaps it's dangerous even to listen to him. And yet, 
Some unfinished question, only half-formed, filled the darkness around them as they made their way back to the city.